Being in Nothingness by Jean-Paul Sartre. Published in 1943, Being in Nothingness, a phenomenological essay on ontology, is considered a cornerstone of the philosophy of existentialism. If Nausea is his most important fictional work, this is his most famous non-fictional work. While in German prison in the 1940s, away from all the fightings, Sartre sat down and read one of the most difficult philosophical books, Martin Heidegger's magnum opus Being in Time, in which the German philosopher settled on the idea of death giving life a meaning it lacks. In other words, to be authentically alive, one must fully realize death. So Sartre wrote his book in reaction to Heidegger, but most crucially in response to the religious notion that we are created by God. Sartre says, no, we are nothing prior to our birth or being. We are born first and then we become something that has an essence. We have no divine essence or divine creator. Like a flower, we germinate, grow and blossom to become a flower. But nobody plants us, we are self-made. Sartre also responds to the psychoanalysis movement led by Sigmund Freud, who argued that beneath the conscious mind there is a whole new and hidden world called the unconscious mind, where all sorts of suppressed emotions, repressed urges and thoughts are kept. According to psychoanalysts such as Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, the unconscious is a much bigger part than the conscious mind. In other words, we are only aware of a fraction of what's going on inside our minds. Sartre says that is rubbish. He argues that we do not have a hidden self floating in the unconscious cave or soup, but we are what we know. Anything we are not conscious of is not us. So Sartre agrees with René Descartes, I think, therefore I am. But unlike Descartes, Sartre doesn't believe in innate knowledge from birth. For Sartre, existence precedes essence. We are born and then we develop the self. Edmund Husserl, a German philosopher, was Sartre's teacher at one point. Husserl's philosophy, phenomenology, argues that our consciousness is always conscious of something. When we know something, we know something, an object or idea or an image. This goes back to Kant who divided knowledge into two, the world of phenomena which is knowable through our animal senses and perception, and noumena which is the unknowable world of things in themselves. So phenomenology is the world of consciousness through the world of phenomena that we get to know through our senses, which removes or ignores the unknowable such as God or afterlife or even the psychoanalytical hidden subconscious or unconscious posited by Freud. So for Sartre, our consciousness is rooted in objects, not some divine essence or hidden unconscious. So Sartre says consciousness is tied to objects. It doesn't come from itself, neither from God. But Sartre also adds that not only consciousness allows us to be aware of the world, but consciousness is also aware of itself as a kind of transparent phenomena. Not only it's aware of objects, but simultaneously it's aware of this awareness. It knows that it knows. It's like a camera that can see, but also knows that it can see. In being in nothingness, Sartre starts with nothingness as the basis of existence, and then moves on to how we fill this void with societal role or fake identity. And finally, he also rejects psychoanalysis of Freud. But first, what is nothingness? To understand nothingness, let's imagine an object we call Mr. Self, who bumps into objects and obstacles like rocks and space. Through these random collisions, it shapes itself into something. Quote, nothingness carries being in its heart. To understand Sartre, let's go back to Martin Heidegger. The German philosopher said that our existence can be summed up by two ends, birth and death. So we exist in time. In other words, our life is finite, meaning we have limited time as a being. So being in time are two sides of the same coin, so to speak. One cannot separate existence from time. Sartre takes this as a starting point and then just focuses on the being itself. But instead of talking about time, he shifts his focus to nothingness. Since we have no divine essence or purpose, we exist as nothing. In other words, our nothingness makes us totally free to float around. 
But this nothing being has to deal with the external world, such as objects or other people, which curtail our freedom. Through our interactions with the world and other people, we have to make choices, which limits our freedom, but also causes us to feel anxiety. To escape these constraints or this limit on our freedom, we escape into our imagination, or rely on someone else for guidance or defer authority to a figure such as God to make choices for us. In other words, existence is like walking in the wilderness that is full of dangerous pitfalls, which limit our freedom. So to escape this non-freedom, we seek answers in our mind by imagining things or inventing things. This often leads us to act unconsciously or take roles in life or take refuge within an identity given to us, like nationality, job, activist, etc., like some flushed out characters in a novel. For example, I'm a YouTuber because I want to fill the void of my existence. We take on roles in order to escape our anguish for the lack of choices, but also for the abundance of choices we experience. Since we are sandwiched between an unbridled imagination or thought and tightly constrained world and regulated actions, we develop a sense of self. In other words, the self is created by free thoughts floating in nothingness, colliding with the unfree outside world of existence. Hence, we are beings in nothingness. A good analogy might be a planet. It started as a misshapen rock floating about until it lost its edges through gravity or collisions with other objects in space, and took a more spherical shape and found a stable orbit in which it can exist. Although for Sot, humans are different because we exist, not like an object in itself, like a rock or a tree, but also exist for itself, which means we are also aware of our existence. To escape this awareness, we take a role, like a teacher, which means we exist in itself. In other words, we fulfill a role, which means we exist for others, not for ourselves. But we can never fully become a thing in itself. We can only manage it for a time and we have to convince ourselves to be a teacher, a thing in itself. In an attempt to become a teacher, a Frenchman or a YouTuber, we try to convince ourselves to be what we are not. This is bad faith. So we come out of nothingness, but we want to be something. To fill the void, we almost fake it, which is bad faith. Bad faith for Sartre simply means living a false existence or self-deception which is also close to a Marxist notion of false consciousness, prevalent among the working class who buy into their pride in nationalism or identity as peaceful moral citizens, or good workers which prevent them from rebelling against an exploitative system. Marx wanted all workers to unite to overthrow the system, but they rarely did. So he blamed on false consciousness, which prevent the workers see themselves as victims. Today, another term often uses internalized racism or repression in which one goes against their interest in accepting the status quo. For Sartre, bad faith means the negation of existence as a thing for itself. For example, when we take a role or a job, we act as if we exist for others or a thing in itself. A waiter acts as though he or she is someone whose only purpose is to wait. Quote, society demands that he limits himself to his function. There are indeed many precautions to imprison a man in what he is, as if he lived in perpetual fear that he might escape from it that he might break away and suddenly elude his condition. In other words, their entire being is reduced to their job. This is also true in terms of social status, nationality, a fan of a sports team, etc. For such humans as sentient beings, we cannot fully become a thing in itself. So what we often do is attempt or pretend to be a teacher or a YouTuber, reducing our entire existence to one role. This is bad faith or self-deception. Why do we do it? It limits our freedom or endless choices we face in life, which is in a way a coping mechanism, because a defined rule or action can calm us down. We don't have to worry about making choices or mistakes. In other words, endless freedom or choices can paralyze us. To escape bad faith, Saad says we must accept our existence as what it is, not something that is not. An authentic person has endless choices at any moment as he or she is facing the future. 
but as a waiter, he or she limits it to one choice, which is inauthentic or bad faith. For Sartre, bad faith also includes social norms, moral values, religious dogmas, and legal obligations, which limit our existential journey of fulfillment as true authentic beings. While social or moral values are created by others, Sartre also considers thinking too much about our own past as bad faith. We always limit our future projections to what happened to us in the past, so this is also bad faith. If we had a bad romantic experience with one person, we project that onto future partners, which is a form of bad faith. Proust spent his entire novel talking about the past in an attempt to regain or recreate his past selves or lost time. Sartre says that is living inauthentically because you only see yourself in the past that no longer exists, not now or future. Sartre's philosophy is a teleological progressive one, similar to Hegel and Marx, that we are heading towards perfection or completion. Sartre also spends a large portion of the book talking about sex. He treats sex as a social act, not just as a biological or physical. Being for others is another form of bad faith. When we build relationship with others, we tend to limit our freedom for acceptance. Sartre gives the example of a shop mannequin that we sometimes mistake for a real person. We behave differently when we realize it's not a person. This shows how much we regulate our behavior for others depending on the kind of relationships we have. The closer, the more we curtail our own and their freedom to be for themselves rather than for others. So our purpose becomes being for others, not free existence per se. We exist to maintain the happiness of the other. For instance, you do everything to make your partner happy, which Sartre says is nothing but emotional alienation because our entire being is taken hostage by how they make us feel and how we make them feel. So love is nothing but a bad faith conflict or a battleground for control of the other. You want them and you want them for yourself and nobody else. No wonder Sartre had an open relationship with Simone. In reality, Simone didn't exercise that freedom as much as Sartre did, which perhaps shows that men and women are different on a biological level. Men have millions of sperms ready at any moment while women only have one egg, which dictates the level and intensity of sexual urge among the sexes. Sartre, however, rejects a biological reason for sex. Sex for Sartre is our attempt to create a completion, but upon orgasm you go back to square one. This stems from nothingness and emptiness of existence. You hike up a mountain or jump on a bungee, and at the end it's never complete. I think Sartre stretches it a bit by saying that there is no biological basis for sex. Evolution doesn't care about Sartre's opinion because he failed to procreate so his genes died with him. But Sartre does make sex different from other basic human urges such as food and survival because for sex to happen you need another person, unless you go the DIY route. The third major point in being in nothingness is consciousness. For Sartre, our consciousness makes us who we are. Anything we are not conscious of or aware of is not us. This goes against the fundamental point psychoanalysts make that consciousness is just the tip of the iceberg. The unconscious controls much of our choices and actions in life. According to Sartre, the psychoanalysis of Sigmund Freud removed the responsibility from his patient by blaming the hidden unconscious for their behavior. Sartre argues that there is a paradox in psychoanalysis that relies on patients reporting a hidden world of unconsciousness where repressed emotions are kept, you either know or don't know. If you don't know, how can you repress those emotions, urges and ideas? Repressed emotions hidden in the unconscious is just an excuse according to Sartre. He says if a patient has repressed certain emotions or urges and they refuse to divulge such unsavory ideas, on some level they are conscious. So the hidden unconscious theory is flawed. Pretending you don't know is self-deception for the sake of self-preservation. We lie so we can avoid responsibility. If we self-censor or hide something in our unconscious, it has to be conscious decision. You do not hide something that you do not know. 
we knowingly hide treasure or past mistakes. So for Sartre, the theory of the unconscious posited by Freud and Jung is nothing but an excuse to make their patients feel better about the bad choices in life. To sum up, in being in nothingness, Sartre, just like Heidegger, makes a distinction between being in itself, like an unconscious phenomena, such as a tree or rock, and being for itself, like humans. The difference is that that thing in itself exists, yet is neither aware of its existence nor has freedom, while the thing for itself is not only aware of its own existence, but also because of this consciousness, we are condemned to be free. So, Sartre's existentialism is founded upon nothingness in which existence comes about.